everybody. Uh, good evening, late afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I could not be happier uh, to, uh, than I am to introduce my good friend and long-term mentor, uh, Michelle Flournoy. Uh, Michelle is the co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors, a prominent strategic consulting firm in Washington, D.C., and the former co-founder and chief executive of the Center for a New American Security, a highly respected nonpartisan think tank also in Washington, where she currently serves on the board. Michelle is widely regarded as one of the nation's foremost experts on national security and defense policy, and her background makes it clear why. During the Obama administration, she served as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, which for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with the organizational chart, is essentially the number three civilian at the Pentagon. Uh, and she did that from February of 2009 to February of 2012. In the mid-1990s, during the Clinton administration, Michelle served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Threat Reduction and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy. Michelle is also a member of the, President's, the current President's Intelligence Advisory Board, the CIA Director's External Advisory Board, and the Defense Policy Board, and is currently a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Aspen Strategy Group, a senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and sits on the Honorary Advisory Committee of the Leadership Council for Women in National Security. Michelle also serves on several boards uh, of prominent companies active in the defense and humanitarian fields. She has edited numerous books and authored dozens of reports and articles on a broad range of defense and national security issues in just about every major publication you can imagine. And her commentary is regularly featured on television and in top tier newspapers and journals. Michelle earned her bachelor's degree in social studies from Harvard and her master's degree in international relations from Oxford University. But uh, other than all of that, Michelle, really what have you accomplished? <laughs> Uh, uh, please join me in, uh, in welcoming uh, Michelle Flournoy to the stage. So our lecture format tonight is a little bit different. I think we're going to experiment more with a fireside chat uh, uh, format. And um, uh, I thought I'd actually start by uh, asking you, Michelle, to uh, reveal your, your secret connection to CSAC and to Sid Drell, and, and, and obviously our, our provost, Ursus Drell, uh, just walked in. So, but I think you should share uh, the kind of deeper connection here um, uh, that you have. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so honored to be here, and especially to uh, give the Drell lecture. Um, back in 1990, when I was a few years out of graduate school and I was a research fellow, at the Kennedy School on the Avoiding Nuclear War Project, um, I got a call um, saying that the Carnegie Corporation had asked McGeorge Bundy, uh, Admiral William Crow, and Dr. Sidney Drell to uh, work on a commission um, on reducing the nuclear danger. And they were looking for a research assistant. And would I be interested in possibly helping? And so I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> of course, yes, this is a great opportunity to work with three sort of icons in their field. And um, it was a wonderful experience. It produced this book, Reducing the Nuclear Danger, uh, and a foreign affairs article that went along with it, which you can still find. And it also resulted in my only ever published photograph, which I took of the three of them, which is on the book jacket. But, um, you know, uh, Sid Drell was a remarkable intellect and made huge scientific contributions, which have already been described. Um, but what may not be known by all of you is he was also a remarkable mentor. Um, and I learned so much from him personally and from the in listening in on the incredible interactions of those two individuals. So anyway, I'm particularly honored to be here um, for the Drell Lecture, given it feels like it's coming full circle in some way, and I hope I can honor him by being here. Well, I, I mean, I can say personally, um, I think one of the ways that you you uh, honor that legacy is that you yourself are such a terrific mentor, and uh, I consider you uh, uh, my the mentor to me on, on as it relates to not the academic side, but being a professional. Um, 
sure I'm very professional very often, but to the degree that I am, I give you a lot of credit for that. And a lot of that stems from when we first met uh, in 2007. Uh, and you and, and Kirk Campbell had just established uh, CNAS, the Center for New American Security. Um, and in addition to my teaching uh, job at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service at the time, I was a senior, part-time senior fellow at CNAS. And you'll recall that in that time frame, 2007, 2008, much of what CNAS did in the think tank community and the, inter and the international security establishment in Washington, much of what we were focused on was uh, the so-called war on terrorism, counterterrorism missions, counterinsurgency, the, uh, the military uh, interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan. And obviously these issues are still uh, very much uh, priorities uh, for you. I know you had a, an, an op-ed with Stephen Hadley uh, just the other day in the Washington Post on Afghanistan. Um, but it does seem that the national security landscape has shifted a bit, and that, that uh, while much of the uh, post the first decade or, or more of the post 9/11 period was dominated by sub-state violence, concerns about terrorism, insurgency, and, and, and others. Now the landscape has shifted a lot more towards a focus on great power politics. So I, that's really what I hope that we can have a conversation about uh, tonight. And so maybe uh, we start with the current administration and how they see the strategic landscape. So the, the December 2017 National Security Strategy, the kind of grand strategy document that every White House puts out um, uh, at least once a term, um, put a lot of emphasis on the challenge uh, posed by great power competition. And the national defense strategy, which came out a few months afterwards in early 2018, was even more stark in this regard. It declared, quote, the central challenge to US prosperity and security is the reemergence of long-term strategic competition by revisionist powers, most notably China and Russia. And that document explicitly stated, quote, that interstate strategic competition, not terrorism, is now the primary concern of US national security. Unquote. I, as an Obama official, I feel like if we had said something like that, we would not have been treated kindly on Fox News. But uh, I wonder, you know, do you agree with that general, with the with the general thrust of that argument about how important great power competition now is for our national security? I do agree that um, we have to give more focus or more attention and sort of bandwidth to great power competition. But I I have some issues with how the strategy treats it. But I, I do think. If you step back and you say, what are the big trends that we're dealing with? Yes, terrorism, international terrorism will remain a persistent threat. Things like proliferation are going to remain persistent threats. We have broader challenges like climate change, which will pr present tremendous challenges and se even security challenges over time. But I think the, what, what the, the piece that the strategy is trying to describe, and I think they got basically right, is that we're moving from uh, sort of what was seen by some as a unipolar moment after the end of the Cold War, where the US had an unrivaled sort of economic and military dominance in the world, uh, to a, a much more multipolar environment, where you have a rise in China, which is uh, going to be very competitive economically uh, and technologically, and perhaps mo probably militarily in some respects. Um, and you have a revisionist Russia. You have Vladimir Putin who, while Russia by many objective standards is a declining power, um, Russia is still using the full range of its instruments to try to reestablish its influence both on its periphery and also now we've seen in the Middle East. It's seeking to undermine the democratic model through intervention in elections, not only here in the United States, but also across Europe and so forth. So you have a number of challenges to the post-World War II international rules-based order, um, and these are coming from great powers, um, both a rising China and a revisionist Russia. Um, where, I, where I quibble with the strategy is sort of lumping those together and immediately assuming that therefore they must be uh, uh, military, necessarily military enemies, um, where I think that's giving up a lot of opportunity for us to try to shape behavior before we get to that point. Well, so that's a, that's a really interesting point. So yeah, I think I think you really hit the nail on the head in the sense that Russia and China are often said in the same sentence, right? right? Um, I mean, you noted that, that China is an ascendant power uh, that is increasingly flexing its muscle globally in all kinds of domains. Russia is a declining but more assertive mm -hmm. uh, power in certain ways. So, how would you, if, if you know, if you're if you're advising the president of the United States about thinking about these challenges, is there some way in which you would you would fundamentally recommend 
thinking about Russia and China in different ways in terms of the challenges? Is one an adversary? Is one a rival? Is another a competitor? Like, what's the what's the key difference in your in your view? Right. Um, I, I think we have to think about China as um, a competitor, but also a country whose cooperation we need to address a number of the challenges we face. It's very difficult to imagine a solution to climate change without partnership with China and participation of China. Very difficult to imagine dealing with nuclear proliferation or North Korea or even the Iran agreement. China was an important party there. Um, and yet, um, I think they will be the most serious economic and technological competitor we face and obviously the most uh, intense military competitor we face in the Asia Pacific. We have to care about that because so much of our prosperity and security in the future, in the next 50 to 100 years, is going to be driven by what happens in Asia and our relationships in Asia. Uh, we have core treaty allies. We have a number of key partners. We care about things like uh, the rules-based order, freedom of navigation, solving disputes peacefully, not resort, you know, not getting into a situation where might, break, might makes right and you have uh, you know, a China that is trying to change the status quo by force. Um, and so I think China is gonna, is, we have to think very carefully about how to compete with China while also cooperating in key areas. And we, if we play, if, we, if the American strategy is successful, we should be able to compete with China without necessarily becoming you know, military enemies that actually go to war. I mean, that would be a profound failure of policy for both the United States and China. And we can come back to, to that. Russia, I think, is a little bit different in that I think, um, you know, uh, Putin is actively uh, meddling in our democratic system. He's actively intimidating uh, other, using, you know, gray zone sort of conflict means, uh, conflict below the level of overt military means in many areas. He's rolled into Crimea and reclaimed that. He's destabilized eastern Ukraine. So he has demonstrated true adversarial behavior and I think is, uh, needs to be treated in a different way um, that, than, than, I would, than I would treat China at this point. So obviously, you know, CSAC from its very origins is focused uh, a lot of its energy on nuclear security, arms control issues, and I thought maybe I could take a, take a moment to talk, ask you some questions about that as it relates to uh, Russia and China. Um, so obviously during the Obama administration, we both served and Russia began to violate the Reagan era intermediate nuclear forces uh, uh, treaty uh, by developing and testing uh, a cruise missile uh, that uh, violated the treaty and uh, ballistic missiles that if they were deployed in, in certain ways would also be in violation of the treaty. We all know that China has heavily invested in intermediate range missiles as a way to keep our forces as far away from China as possible and to put force of pressure on our allies uh, uh, in Asia. Um, and Trump taking, you know, I think being encouraged by John Bolton and some others, but, but basically noting Russian violations and the challenge that uh, China's intermediate range nuclear forces uh, or conventional forces pose pulled out of, pulled out of the IMF. Um, he's also signaled, he, the president, has also signaled his desire to expand the nuclear arsenal, not, not just modernize it, but to expand the kinds of nuclear weapons to include lower, lower yield, more and lower yield nuclear weapons. And right toward the end of the Trump administration, New START, the foundation, you know, the treaty that essentially caps our strategic arsenals between us and Russia is due to expire. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, we're modernizing our nuclear forces. Russia and China are modernizing our nuclear forces. We're abandoning arms control treaties. We might abandon the new uh, START treaty. Are we on the precipice of a, of a major new nuclear arms race? And what do you, what, if so, what are the implications of that? Well, I think it would be the height of folly for the U.S. to go down the road of uh, a re-energized nuclear competition um, with the other nuclear powers, particularly Russia and China. I, you know, I recognize that Russia was violating the INF Treaty, no question. Everybody agreed on those facts. Um, I would have liked to have seen the administration make a more concerted and sustained effort to try to incent Russia to come back into compliance with the treaty and to avoid walking away from it entirely. Some people will argue that wasn't possible. I'm not convinced that we did everything possible before we threw that treaty away. 
Um, I think uh, some people in the Pentagon think that we're going to be able to deploy intermediate range missiles throughout Asia, and I have yet to find a host country that is willing to actually welcome that. So I think that's a little bit of wishful thinking at the moment. Um, but my biggest worry at this moment is what happens to New START. Um, we have a strategic arms control treaty in place with Russia that has capped our strategic arsenals. And basically, uh, while we have, you know, both, you know, we, the United States has been modernizing for uh, our deterrent to keep it safe and reliable and secure. It is, we have not been investing in lots of new types of nuclear weapons. We have not been growing the arsenal. We have not, it's really, we've succeeded through leadership of, uh, I have to say, uh, acknowledge you know, Secretary Perry, you know, leadership from people like Bill Perry and others, we've managed to put nuclear weapons on the back burner of our strategy. Um, and they're really focused, uh, we've been focused on deterrence when it comes to things nuclear. Um, I worry that if START is allowed to expire, we will sort of find ourselves back in a nuclear competition with Russia that will first of all be unnecessary, secondly be dangerous, and third, divert resources from the very real modernization and adaptation we need to do in conventional and other technology areas to be successful in deterring conflict with China um, and with others. So I, I think it would just be a, a real mistake. All that we need to do to extend START is to uh, have the two presidents sign a five-year extension. Um, I'm hoping that the intelligence community who values the verification measures of that treaty will, will you know, express their views. I'm hoping that the Joint Chiefs of Staff will stand up and say, this is not what we need to be focused on. Nuclear deterrence is there. Yes, of course, we have to invest to keep it viable, but the real competition is somewhere else, and we do not want to be diverting unnecessary resources into a nuclear competition that we don't need to have. So let's talk a little bit about those other technological domain, domains. So if there's an opportunity cost, I mean, budgets are budgets. I remember the conversations we had right at the tail end of the Obama administration about you know, the Pentagon would, would come to us with the desire to make free up resources or get additional resources to invest in things like space and cyber and artificial intelligence. And at the same time, we were having these debates about how much nuclear modernization was going to cost to recapitalize the triad and things like that. There, these, these are direct trade offs, even as big as the military budget is. You know, we know that the, both the Russians, but especially the Chinese, are making massive investments in cyber, in AI, in cutting edge technologies like quantum computing, uh, their you know, advanced air and missile defense systems to, keep our, to put our forces at risk uh, uh, in their uh, uh, purported spheres of influence, um, conventional modernization, stealth, precision strike, advanced conventional munitions like hypersonics. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on outside of the nuclear domain. I guess if you uh, had to sit with uh, a president and a chairman and say, you know, if you can rack and sack the priorities of where the investments of the Pentagon should be made in a strategic competition with Russia and China, where would you, where would you put the most chips? Well, uh, how long do we have? No, <laughs> um, no I, think, I think the thing we have to, we have to start from understanding, you know, what has changed. We have still today the world's most powerful military in conventional terms, the world's most capable military. But if we rest on our laurels and we don't make proper investments, that is a, that is, that, that is a deteriorating situation or condition. It will not survive on its own. Um, and why is that? Because when the first time we really demonstrated that for the world was with the Gulf, first Gulf War. And ever since that time, for, so for several decades now, um, countries that th have thought about you know, competing with the United States or having to face the US military in the future have gone to school on what we were able to do in that Gulf War. And they have developed asymmetric strategies to try to undermine our strengths and exploit our vulnerabilities. Um, the defense wonks like to call this current flavor of that you know, anti-access area denial strategies, meaning that uh, countries like Russia and China have developed lots of capabilities of various types 
to try to prevent the U.S. from even projecting power from our shores and from being effective when we get uh, close to their territories um, using a, a broad variety of means. So I would start by really under, you know, on the theory that the enemy gets a vote or the adversary gets a vote, I would start by really understanding what do we think they will do to try to hamper U.S. Uh, efforts and can we deal with that? So if you look at Chinese doctrine, their preferred approach is to use cyber attacks on critical infrastructure to prevent U.S. forces from ever leaving ports and bases in the United States, to use attacks on space-based assets to blind us, to prevent us from communicating, to prevent us from being able to navigate or target anything with precision. So that suggests two places we need to invest in is you know, uh, critical uh, uh, capabilities for cyber defense for critical infrastructure, critical uh, defenses and resilience in space, um, for starters. Then when you look to actually be in the region um, with your forces, you've got to be able to have forces that can project power from outside the threat ring that they've established. So you have to make investments to buy back range and the ability to, to, um, to hold targets at risk that are heavily defended. And you also have to be able to have some forces, whether they're undersea or unmanned or what have you, that can op operate in a highly contested environment without consistent, uh, with, you know, in, in an environment where you may lose uh, access to your SATCOMs or your targeting uh, navigation and, and so forth. Um, so it's a very different kind of situation where we have to assume the U.S. will not have military support priority in any domain initially or even consistently. We'll gain it, we'll lose it, we'll gain it, we'll lose it, and we have to be able to fight in that context. So, you know, people talk a lot about the technologies, but the biggest challenge here is actually a change of mindset and really fundamentally rethinking concepts for how we're gonna operate and how we're gonna be effective in those domains. The other thing I would say is, to, in my mind, this challenge says, you know, the number one thing we should be focused on is making deterrence effective. Communicating our resolve clearly, um, what, what, what and who are we willing to defend, and making sure we have the capability to either deny an adversary from achieving their objectives, or if that's too high a bar in a given case, to be able to impose costs and to do so very clearly, that will make them rethink their plan <laughs> and, and, and not actually pursue that objective. But the name of the game in this situation uh, is not to fight a major prolonged land war with a nuclear power. <laughs> it is to deter that conflict from happening in the first place. Well, on that, um, you know, a lot of the systems that you mentioned, cyber, uh, space, undersea, there's, a, there's a, a high degree of intermingling and entanglement between the conventional side of the house and the nuclear side of the house. And I think what worries some people is that the very doctrines that you've talked about with China, I think Russia has a similar doctrine, frankly, too, to try to blind us, slow us down, and go after after these networks might start to touch on systems that, where it wouldn't be immediately obvious what their intentions were and whether you might have a myth, a, a myth not, you know, deterrence might fail in a conventional context and then you stumble into something in a nuclear context. So one of the most important things that we should be doing that we're not uh, with both Russia and China, probably separately initially, is to have a 21st century version of discussions on strategic stability. Uh, we used to talk about nuclear stability in crisis, nuclear strategic stability. We now need to factor in other systems and technologies that could affect strategic stability, like cyber, like space, and so forth. And I do think there's some truly catastrophic places that we have nobody's gone yet. <laughs> so is there an opportunity to have a dialogue where you create some norms and you take certain things off the table. Is it possible, for example, to sit down with the Chinese and help them understand that truly catastrophic cyber attacks on American critical infrastructure might succeed in complicating our power projection from bases along the eastern seaboard, 
but he'd also probably uh, kill civilians. You know, think of hospital electricity systems being shut down. Um, think of all of the ramifications of a large-scale takedown of a grid in a region. You're going to have substantial American civilian casualties on American soil. Any American president is going to see that as an attack on the United States and an act of war. It's really important that we help others understand that and perhaps have a normative discussion. Can we agree that we will not use cyber for massive critical infrastructure attacks against each other's homeland? Can that be a norm that we establish? The, I'm not, you know, maybe that's not the right idea. Maybe there are better ideas, but we have to be having that strategic dialogue and we're not. Um, and I think having those normative discussions uh, is very, very important, very, very important. It's also important at the more operational and tactical level. Back at the height of the Cold War, we had uh, very intensive negotiations with the Soviet Union on incidents at sea. The, 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 the fear was each side was so aggressive in its naval operations that even without intending to go to war, we could have some kind of miscalculation or accident that would escalate out of control. And so we negotiated with our Cold War you know, adversary a set of rules of the road for how we would deal with that situation and de-escalate the crisis. Again, we need to be having those conversations with others and updating those to reflect some of these new technologies and capabilities that are coming online. Yeah, and it speaks to that area of affirmative, there's an affirmative agenda with yes. these countries too that, that needs to be pursued, even, even in the very areas where we're competing with them. Um, you know, you, you, you mentioned briefly that, that, I want to talk mostly about China for a minute, uh, mentioned briefly the economic competition, we're obviously seeing that in the context of the trade war and uh, uh, efforts to restrict uh, Chinese technology here in the United States and, and, around, the, and around the world. We talked about military uh, competition a bunch already. I wonder though, for those who see a kind of new Cold War emerging, uh, there's increasingly an emphasis on the ideological component of the struggle with China too. Do you, do you, do you share the view that part of the competition with China is ideological? If it is, is it useful to think of it in, through a Cold War lens or is the ideological challenge different? Um, uh, how, do you, how do you think about that? I do think there's an ideological dimension, but in general, I think the Cold War analogy is more unhelpful than helpful. Um, China is a fully integrated power in, in the global economy, uh, in international institutions. It's a completely different situation. I don't know what containment means when it comes to China. I don't think it's advisable. I don't think it's possible. So I think the whole Cold War frame is not very helpful. It kind of leads us down some blind alleys. I do think there's an ideological component in the sense that, you know, the number one objective of Chinese leadership is to maintain communist party control of the system of government. Um, part of the biggest threat to that system of government would be for some kind of, for ec economic liberalization and increasing expectations on the part of the population to lead towards some kind of democratic movement of the kind we're actually seeing in Hong Kong. Um, that is an existential threat to the regime. And so I do think as Beijing you know, works overseas, shows up in institutions, um, there's an ideological dimension that wants to put an emphasis on the messiness of democracy. Um, the, they'd love to be able to show that democracies can't compete as effectively economically with an authoritarian system. Um, they would love to have recipients of One Belt, One Road assistance believe that the best way to maintain your control in your society is to adopt a surveillance state apparatus of the kind that we've built here at home and can help provide you. So there is an ideological dimension. That said, I don't believe they are territorially expansionist beyond the sort of second home to beyond the territorial claims within the nine dash line that we've all seen on the map, you know, which are pretty extensive, don't get me wrong, those are pretty aggressive throughout Asia, but I don't see China as an expansionist imperial power in the way that the Soviet Union was. 
But if I could just come back on the competition point, the, the thing that I think is most missing in our discussion of this if, 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 is that I think the number one thing we can do to compete effectively in a more contested environment is invest in the drivers of our own competitiveness here at home. Uh, science and technology, research and development, using federal funding to incent focus on some of these key technology areas, STEM education, access, to, you know, broader access to higher education, 21st century infrastructure. Why in the world is it that America doesn't have not only uh, a rival to Huawei in terms of 5G providing a provider, but a whole ecosystem of companies that are leading on 5G. I mean, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, there are, we, we, we can, there's so much, and smart immigration policy. We benefit from immigration here. Look at the, you, you all know, look at across Silicon Valley, a huge number of the founders of our most creative, innovative companies have come else, from elsewhere. Often they come to a place like Stanford for their education, and when we're smart, we welcome them and encourage them to stay and build companies here and be part of the idea and the reality and the vision of America. So investing here at home, I think, is the most important thing that we can do to situate ourselves well for this competition. And I also, I am an optimist. Um, you know, I have to be to get out of the bed in the morning in Washington these days. But, you know, uh, I, you know, there's so many times in our history where we have been challenged, you know, the Great Depression, um, the 60s, the, the recession that President Obama inherited coming into office, and we have a wonderful track record as a nation to uh, rising to the occasion uh, and pulling together and competing extremely well um, in the world. Well, you know, it's interesting. I wonder if we could maybe pull two of the threads together. So the ideological competition piece and the invest in our own technology infrastructure, you know, I would, we could also add the other comparative advantages we have, like our network of allies and partners around the world, which China doesn't we have. have that. Yeah, all those things, right? I mean, they're part of competing with China is getting our own house and our own side of things in order. But on the ideological piece, I, I wonder if you, you know, my sense is China doesn't want to export its ideology, like the communist oh, ideology. Yeah. It wants to export its methodology. That is to show that digital authoritarianism, the surveillance state, is a way in which authoritarian regimes can keep a lid on their populations uh, and modernize and grow their economies and follow China's path towards ascendance without having to go down the messy democratic liberal path. My, my concern, I don't know if you share this one though, is that many of the same technologies that China will use against its own people ubiquitous sensors, facial recognition, using machine learning and big data analytics to predict behavior and to crack down on people. That in the first instance, they will use it inside China. Then they will export it to their autocratic friends, but that they will search for ways to weaponize those technologies against us. Because the best way to have, keep us on our back foot, because this is what the Russians demonstrated in 2016, is to sow divisions within democracy. So uh, do you worry that China may take that uh, you know those technologies, which the Xi Jinping in particular is obsessed with at home, and weaponize them against us or other Western democracies. I I do think that I, I think your distinction between ideological and methodological is a good one, um, and I do think that they may uh, certainly weaponize some of this. Um, or it's, the way I would put it is they will use our openness, which is a core strength and differentiator for the United States and for our Western allies. They'll you try to they'll use it against us. I mean, they will, and they have. I uh, mean, at least the Russians have already, and the Chinese have in some ways as well in terms of intellectual property theft and espionage and so forth. Um, but I think that that's not a compelling argument for us to not be an open society. It's a compelling argument for us to you know, do a better job of protecting the crown jewels that are essential to our national security while maintaining an open system that ultimately, in the long term, will be more uh, a 
effective um, in terms of meeting the needs of populations and in terms of attracting others and so forth. I also want to highlight something you said, which I should have mentioned earlier, which is our alliances around the world and our partnerships are a huge strategic advantage. Um, and I think, like when I look at the trade war that we're in with China right now, um, I think there's a broad consensus that we have some real issues. There are structural problems in the, in the way in which we interact economically, whether it is the large amount of IP theft that's occurred, whether it is unfair uh, subsidization of Chinese state-owned enterprises and, 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 and firms, uh, whether it's uh, forced tech transfer of American businesses working in China. You, know, you can go down the list. My problem with the current approach is that um, we've you know, this administration has chosen to go it alone, as if this is a bilateral U.S.-China problem. But if you were to ask any of our friends in the European Union, or Japan, or, or, or South Korea, or others, um, who've embraced more, you know, more rules of the road-based trading systems, open, open trading systems for the most part, we would have been much more effective to, to pool our, 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 our resources, if you will, and, and deal with China um, together. Um, and I think that's generally true in other areas as well. So we are not only, we're not leveraging those strategic relationships effectively right now, and we are in, in many ways um, sort of unnecessarily um, degrading or, or, or taking, uh, either, either criticizing or, or taking for granted many of the allies that we should be doubling down with. You know, part of our openness, obviously, has also been an openness to being highly integrated with China, which you mentioned earlier is a big difference between the Cold War and, and now. Um, there seems to be a big debate going on within the Trump administration and more broadly that even as kind of Washington has shifted into a more hawkish posture on China, there is a debate about how entangled versus decoupled we should be with China. And here in Silicon Valley and here at Stanford, these have very real consequences, yeah, yeah. right? So in your view, from a national, through a national security lens, how much should we be pushing for decoupling in areas of, uh, you know, of research and development on cutting edge technologies like AI, or quantum computing, computing? How, how assertive should we be on kind of pushing other countries to move away from Huawei and you know, Chinese uh, 5G uh, infrastructure? At places like Stanford, how welcoming should we be to uh, Chinese students? And places like Silicon Valley, how welcoming should we be for Chinese investment? Like, how much entanglement versus decoupling is the right answer, given how central these technologies are now becoming to this, this competition? You know, I, I think we have to start from an understanding that, um, you know, we are in an integrated global economy and much of the capital flow, much of the human capital flow is a positive thing. Um, we do need to, where there's a national security application of a technology, um, we do have to uh, be very careful and we have to protect things that could otherwise undermine our ability to be successful in defense and deterrence and so forth. But I guess for me, it's, I envision this going after this with a scalpel. Very nuanced, carefully carving, you know, where are the, where are the lines? Not a sledgehammer. <coughs> right now I'm worried that we're going after with, it a, with, a, with a sledgehammer. And I'll give you an example. Um, right now, there are parts of the Pentagon that are looking at companies and saying, if you've accepted any Chinese capital whatsoever, we don't want you working with DOD. <laughs> There's a difference between passive capital that is you know, just looking for a good return on investment, no seat on the board, no access to non-public intellectual property, no special rights or you know, access, versus capital that gives you all of those things. If you were to cut off Chinese passive capital in Silicon Valley, it's like drying their blood, taking the blood out of the bloodstream of one of the most dynamic parts of our economy. It's 
it's, it, would be a, it would be an own goal. It would be a self-inflicted wound. Why would we do that? And we don't need to do that to protect our national security. Now, if you tell me that we are high, you know, highly dependent on a Chinese supplier that is uniquely able to provide some critical component to something in our national security, yeah, that's probably a problem. Just like we've had the problem of relying on Russian rocket engines for some of our space launch, and we're finally getting to the point where we're creating US alternatives. So we need to use scalpels. And then there's some areas that are just really intellectually difficult to manage. Like how in the world do you, use, you, know, do you regulate what is shared and not shared in the world of AI? When you look how this actually works in terms of how open the system is, how internationally collaborative the work is, is it, do we try to regulate the data? Certainly can't regulate algorithms, can't regulate for the brain, you know, what's in people's brains. So, you know, how, what is the right approach to, um, to protection in some of these key areas? And I think that's a great set of thesis topics for many of you in the audience here. <laughs> Well, you know, I, you surfaced actually a lot of issues that I think, I, I hope this administration uh, takes into account more and, and if there's a new administration, they take into account on these issues. But, I mean, explicit and implicit in your remarks are, to the degree that we do these things, we should be using a scalpel. So there's a sense of discrimination and proportionality to, to, our, to our efforts. There's the, the sense that we should be multilateral. All else, that we should be doing this with like-minded countries, especially in the so-called free world. I mean, I think if there's a Cold War analogy, maybe it's that the democracies need to get together a little bit more. Um, but I wonder, but another thing that's at least implicit in yours is that it, it's the kind of degree of conditionality. That we should have a set of standards that we agree to with others that China can either opt into or opt out of. So that at least in those places where we do try to, where we cut the cord, China's had an, op an option mm -hmm. to raise its standard to a new global standard. And when they don't, then we have a better rationale to, right. to move them aside. Right. I don't know, are there other, are there other things? Do you agree with that? Uh, what, what? I do agree with that. I do think we want to have a set of standards that, that um, and you know, if, you, if we go back to the trade example, that is exactly what we were trying to do with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It was a high standards multilateral trade agreement in Asia um, that, you know, we never shut the door on China, but it, the question was, would China want to meet those standards uh, in terms of labor and environment and openness and fair, you know, level playing field and all that. Um, I also think, you know, so I, so I do think that is right. Um, I, I do, I don't want to be Pollyannish though. I, I do want to make sure that I, I emphasize, I do think we need to be clear eyed um, about, you know, there are instances, you know, China does have a doctrine of civil military fusion, uh, which means that any advance in the commercial tech sector that is in, of interest to the PLA has to be shared with the PLA and will be shared, is being shared with PLA. Um, uh, there are uh, research collaborations that are sought by China to gain access to national security relevant IP. There are very few you know, but some cases of students or faculty or others who are sent to the United States with an ulterior motive for gathering intelligence and so forth. But, you know, so we do need to be clear-eyed, and I think universities need to have internal risk management systems to be able to assess what's going on and be clear-eyed about it. But we shouldn't let the tiny, tiny minority of cases, you know, have us decide we're not going to accept international students, or we're not going to have any research collaboration whatsoever, or we're not going to accept any money. I mean, again, it, 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 you, we, we have to be very clear-eyed, but also very careful um, that we don't lose all of the benefits that we've gained from that free flow of people and ideas and collaborative work, which in 99% of the cases benefits both sides and poses no national security risk whatsoever. But we do need to get smarter and more effective in dealing with the 1% that, or whatever the percentage, a small percent that does have the potential to threat, be a threat. Yeah, I, mean, I think this is, 
apropos of your point that part of this is, is being true to ourselves, I mean, one of our inherent advantages is how diverse and attractive our country has been. And the number of students who come here from other countries who then want to stay here, either because the jobs are good or they like we it here, the weather's nice. We should be making that easier, not harder yeah. for people. That makes a lot of sense. Um, well, let me try it in, 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 you said you were an optimist, which helps you get through yes. daily life in the swamp. Um, I, I, maybe we can uh, close on a, on a more optimistic note. So as you look, as you look out uh, at great power competition with China uh, and, and Russia, um, you mentioned a little bit where you saw like, an affirmative agenda. But, like, where are the areas where, I mean, I, I will say, I, I, had an, I had a conversation with an unnamed Trump official about China, and I said, I understand what you're trying to do on trade. I don't agree with it, but I understand. I understand your concerns about them in the military domain and technology. I said, well, what's your affirmative agenda with China? Like, what are you trying to accomplish alongside them? And the, and the, the official who was pretty highly placed at the White House looked at me like, I don't understand your question. <laughs> Uh, and that there isn't currently an affirmative agenda with China. Now, I think the Obama administration prioritized climate change as an affirmative agenda with, with China, and maybe didn't have sharp enough elbows with China in other areas, right? So maybe there's a balance between the two. But as you look forward, what would you advise are the handful of areas where we need to be active in making sure we can carve out some cooperative solutions with China? Well, I think. Uh, I do think we need a, an affirmative agenda, and I think we need to have a much more deeply engaged diplomatic relationship. And not that we're, you know, we're talking about a lot of issues of mutual concern or, or difference, as the case may be. Um, the, one of the things that worries me is I think that's going to be a lot harder. Um, one of the effects of this trade war has been to empower a harder line set of voices in Beijing that believe that now, see, you know, U.S. is unreliable. They're going to be an they're inevitably going to become our adversary. Um, stop all this, you know, fluffy talk about engagement. We have to decouple. We can't be reliant. We can't trust them. Um, and so let's get ready. Uh, I think it's going to be, so I think it's going to be harder to re-engage, but that absolutely must happen. I do think climate change remains on a high on the agenda because we can't get to an improved outcome without uh, the Chinese being made major partners in that. Um, oh, by the way, we have to fundamentally change our own course on that as a government. Um, Non-proliferation, whether it's North Korea, whether it's getting back to some kind of constraints on Iran, or other cases. Um, I do think this question of strategic stability, how do we try to avoid miscalculation, inadvertent escalation? Um, are there things that we can take off the table because we would truly understand that they would be catastrophic for both sides? Um, those are some of the places that I would, um, I would start. Well, great. Um, well, at this point, we'll transition. We'll now transition to the good questions, the ones that come from you all. Um, uh, so I've, we've collected some cards here. Um, I think it's actually a good transition from your strategic stability point, which is uh, we have one question from the audience, which is that the 2018 uh, Trump administration's nuclear posture review threatened uh, that the United States. Uh, there are a narrow set of circumstances which the United States would consider using nuclear weapons in response to a major non-nuclear strategic attack, which a lot of people interpreted as the type of massive cyber attacks against our infrastructure or things that might touch on nuclear infrastructure uh, uh, in the cyber space uh, domain. Um, does a warning like that make much sense to you? I mean, you talked about you talked about the importance of deterrence. Do you think warnings like that are 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 credible and enhance uh, deterrence? Uh. I think the more effective way to um, go after this question of uh, let's not target each other's nuclear command and control is, is again through a strategic dialogue that really fully explores where that kind of scenario would lead us and how dangerous that would be. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, uh, declaratory policy um, across cultures coming from different doctrinal contexts is very hard to communicate 
effectively doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, but um, yeah, I, I, I would approach that in a different way rather than trying to do, through, do it through a, a sentence in the nuclear posture review. Um, so I, 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 I promise you I did not plant this question, but okay. it is about uh, your old partner in crime at CNAS, Richard Fontaine. So this is okay. what, uh, so maybe Richard's here if he planted this. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Richard Fontaine, a uh, longtime staffer for John McCain, who's now uh, uh, the president of CNAS, the think tank that Michelle uh, uh, co-founded. Um, he recently, Richard recently authored a piece in Foreign Affairs arguing the great power competition was the top priority for DC foreign policy folks, the establishment, uh, but not the American people. Um, what, what, I guess, what, what do you think the, the top national security priorities for the American people are? And what, what, about, what about the great power competition do you think uh, the American public should understand more? Um, do you, I mean, do you agree that there's this disconnect, uh, uh, and how can it be addressed? Um, Should it be addressed? I, I do think there is a disconnect. Um, I think the conversation in Washington among sort of national security, the national security community, it's actually quite broad and quite bipartisan, and that conversation is all about this. Um, but when you leave Washington and you ask Americans what are they concerned about, Usually it's other things like, you know, healthcare and, you know, a living wage and education, but if you press them on national security, um, they may think, they may raise, some will raise climate change, some will raise terrorism, some will raise the Russian interference in our election, but this notion of great power competition and particularly the security dimensions of co uh, competition with China is not, sort of front and center um, for most people. And so I think, you know, in the past when we've had these, this kind of disconnect, I think it's a question of leadership. I mean, I think, you know, think about the kind of conversation that President Kennedy had with the American people um, about why we needed to compete in space. Um, that's not we're, not, we're not having that kind of leadership at the moment. We're not having that kind of national conversation. Um, I do think you have to be careful because if you do it in a, a sort of heavy-handed way, you can sort of stir up um, a sort of response that goes too far of, you know, you know, making China an immediate necessary enemy, which I think is not where we want to go. Um, but I, I do think there is a, a challenge of we need to have much more of a national dialogue. <laughs> Um, on what the challenges we face really are. Since you mentioned CNAS, and I, I have to just say this, um, one of the person who's probably most responsible for the founding of CNAS is actually Bill Perry, because when everybody, <laughs> when everybody thought that Kurt Campbell and I were crazy to and they're saying, don't do this, don't do this, Washington doesn't need another think tank, what are you doing? The first person who said, I think you should do it. It was Bill Perry, and he put his money where his mouth was by being our first chairman of the board. So thank you for that, Bill. <laughs> um, and thank you, too. <laughs> I worked there for a bit. Um, so, you know, I do, I do think I, on this public question, um, I mean, I think what a lot of the polling suggests is it's the degree that, that a lot of Americans think about uh, international politics, and I think. Here, President Trump is keyed into something quite fundamental. They're very focused on these kind of interdomestic issues, right? The, the ways in which the global economy mm -hmm. and uh, the global system kind of spills across our borders in the forms of migration or uh, 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 interference in our democracy or terrorism or climate change. That is, the, and, and that so I think that one challenge that all of us have is to try to contextualize some of these broader trends in terms of the lived anxieties that that, that, that people have. Part of the role, you know, one of the big stakeholder obviously here in Silicon Valley are technology companies. I wonder, one of the questions we, we, we have here is what, what role do you think um, American-based technology companies that nevertheless see themselves as global companies, mm -hmm. but are increasingly cognizant of the fact that the United States and China are caught in this competition, like what is the right role of the private sector in navigating that competition, in standing up to certain 
values that the United States has traditionally championed? Like, how should the private sector be thinking about its responsibility uh, in this in, at this time? Right. So um, I think it's there are a number of issues that come up. Number one is I think uh, um, companies that are enjoying the the freedoms and benefits of working, being headquartered in the United States and working out of a place like Silicon Valley or Austin, Texas or Route 128 or wherever, have to recognize that they are, yes, they may have mission, a sense of mission that is for global public good and they may be supplying a global customer base, but they are enjoying the benefits of being American companies and being based in the United States. Um, I would like to think that that would engender some sense of responsibility to contribute um, in uh, some way to the defense of the country, the security of the country, and to avoid doing things that might ca ultimately cause us harm. Um, my experience is actually, despite some of the headlines you've heard about specific cases where companies have said, we don't want to work with you or what have you, my experience is actually that a lot of companies are going through a very uh, um, productive and mature discussion about principles and norms about the type of work they will do and won't do. Um, I'll t take, for example, Microsoft, where they've are, you know published a set of principles on cyber, they've published a set of principles on AI, they've published a set of principles on that will guide their work with DoD. Um, they have an active <coughs> process for reviewing specific cases and do they meet the principles or not. And then they have strong leadership to say, look, you know, we're not going to force anybody to work on DOD work, but we as a company are going to do DOD work that aligns with these principles. And if you as an employee have a problem with that, you can choose to go work somewhere else. I've also encountered in my hat, West Exec hat, there are just dozens and dozens, probably hundreds, of uh, tech companies who actually want to contribute to U.S. national security, who are, have something to offer, who are eager to bang on the door of the Pentagon or the intelligence community or the law enforcement community, wherever, and they, they just need a little help navigating how to do that. So I, I think there's plenty of desire uh, to contribute. Um, I think the biggest thing we have to go after is the obstacles that prevent, to, that make that hard, harder than it should be. And most of it is on the side of the, the you know, the acquisition system, um, the fact that we make it really hard for tech talent to go back and forth between Silicon Valley and government, uh, and so forth. So I think it's, it's more a matter of removing obstacles than anything. On that, there was something we were talking about briefly in the green room that is relevant to that about your general concerns about the talent deficits we're having in the government as a whole. We were saying, talking that you know, one thing that is underappreciated is we can have all these conversations about policies and strategies, but at the end of the day, they're executed by actual human beings. And I worry that the next president of the United States, Republican or Democrat, is going to get in the cockpit and turn the key and realize there's no engine because uh, there's nobody there. Uh, uh, the, you know, the State Department's been depopulated. So the, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the balance between the military side of the house and the civilian side of the house and the Pentagon is way out of whack. So what, what, what do you think our priorities need to be in kind of recapitalizing the human capital yeah. of the national security enterprise and bringing in people in areas like tech or climate or other things that we don't traditionally have not been very good at? What, what should we be looking at? I would love to see the next president really issue a call to national, a Kennedy-esque kind of call to national service, um, and uh, and particularly government service, although there are lots of ways to serve. Um, I would, we need to open up the pathways um, to bring uh, new talent in, whether it is, you know, uh, young graduates from, from Stanford Political Science and Department in CSAC, or whether it is tech talent, um, coming in, but we also, I think, we've, you know, we've had a huge brain drain at the sort of mid to senior level, and I actually think that you can't grow, grow that talent in a couple of years. That is experienced talent 
that once you lose it, it's really hard to replace. And so I'd like to see, there have been some precedent, there is some precedent for this, a sort of an effort to recruit people who left civil service, who left senior executive service, um, to try to recruit some of those folks back, back in. You think about the State Department has lost over 100 ambassador level folks in the last two to three years. Um, and those were people who still had 10, 15 years of service at the ambassador level, um, and they're gone. I would love to see a program that authorizes recruiting them back in um, to resume you know, at that level or you know, maybe even a higher pay grade reflecting whatever experience that they had in the interim. But we're gonna have a major human capital <coughs> rebuilding project in government um, to, uh, to go forward. And do you think, you know, you spent so much time, I mean, we worked together at the, at the Pentagon, you spent so much time building up this impressive cadre of civilian advisors for the Secretary, and, and the Undersecretary's Office for Policy really played the kind of the national security advisor to the Secretary of Defense role, and it, as a, not a counterweight in a negative sense, in a balancing sense, but as another voice at the table, uh, uh, along with the Chairman and the Joint Staff and the Services and the Combatant Commands. My sense is that that is profoundly out of whack uh, these days. How concerned are you about the imbalance inside of the, the Pentagon between civilian and military advisors? Yeah. I mean, the, the secretary is the only civilian in the Defense Department that's in the chain of command um, between the president and the combatant commands. But the secretary can't do that job all alone. And so there are statutory uh, elements that basically lay out how his or her staff are, is supposed to support that civilian oversight of military plans, operations, and so forth. Um, that function has atrophied both because of um, the slowness of appointing personnel, the brain drain of a lot of civil servants, and so forth. Um, I do think that that piece can actually be rebuilt fairly quickly in terms of political appointees. Um, if you have a strong secretary, you get a great team in there, they understand what their jobs are, they understand how the system is supposed to work at its best. I'm not worried about that. Where I am worried about is the loss of that next level of long-time expertise um, in the civil servants, the civil service that may have chosen to retire rather than stay um, in recent years. And again, that's the, we get back to can you attract some of that talent back? Can you open up the floodgates and get more talent in through unconventional channels to, to really repopulate that staff underneath the political team, political appointed team that comes in? So switching gears back to an audience question, and it really hits on a theme that you touched on a number of times in, in, in our initial conversation, which was you know how important it is for the United States to kind of stand up for its values to you know, assert a set of norms and rules that we try to get others to buy into. Um, what role does that play in the human rights dimension, do you think, as it relates to Russia and China? Because on the one hand, you have two regimes that are uh, pretty repressive uh, mm -hmm. at home. Uh, what, what China's doing to the Uyghurs, uh, we're all watching very closely what's happening in, in Hong Kong. Uh, obviously, uh, Putin has been quite uh, repressive at home. So there's lots to criticize, and a lot, of, a lot of people have been critical that the current administration has not elevated the human rights conversation enough into that equation. On the other hand, you mentioned in your comments, one thing that Russia and China have in common is that they're both paranoid about regime change, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and believe that, you know, I, I, Xi Jinping probably believes the CIA is somehow involved yeah. in Hong Kong. So as we try to navigate Great power competition, concerns about strategic stability and standing up for our values. Like, what is the right balance to strike in putting you know, human rights into the equation in our conversations with these countries? Well, I think this is an area where if we're to be true to ourselves, our values, our history, we have to be a champion for human rights in terms of our diplomacy, um, speaking out for human rights, um, defending programs that seek to uh, advance human rights, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the fair treatment of the, the least fortunate, whether it's refugees or displaced persons or uh, migrants. Um, I think if we lose that, we lose who we are. 
Um, now, sometimes there are definitely situations, many situations, where we have our human, our concern about human rights also competes with some other interest. And the hard choices in American foreign policy are often when we have interests that compete with one another, and it's a matter of how do you make those those trade-offs. Um, I don't, you know, I think it's it's, uh, and, th and that's it, it, you really have to sort of think it through on a case by um, case uh, basis. But I, I I think it's a mistake for the United States to stop being an overt champion of universal human rights, um, at least in our example and how we behave and in our diplomacy uh, and and what we stand for. Um, I don't, does that mean that we should be launching covert action programs around the world to overthrow non-democratic regimes? No. <laughs> so I mean, there's a middle ground here. <laughs> um, yes, one would hope so. Uh, so another question from the, from the audience. Um, so the national defense strategy, which I referenced right at the outset of our conversation, um, argues that we have been in a long period of strategic atrophy. And the questioner asks, do we have, do we have the right thinking uh, going on in our institutions? And I would narrow it down to just, you know, you've looked, you're very close observers of the Pentagon, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, the Pentagon is reoriented towards great power competition. They're thinking about this more. But are they really, uh, or, or are they just adapting what they were doing before, especially the services, uh, and kind of wrapping it up in a new package. And I know that the comment on the Marine Corps has gotten a lot of uh, uh, kudos uh, for really rethinking the role of the Marines going forward, but a lot of that is also an implicit criticism of the other services for not doing as much creative thinking. So w is there enough of you know, the right kind of thinking at the Pentagon? I, I, think, I think it's, there is in some quarters and there's not in others, so it's a mixed bag. But I do think there's a lot of, there's more and more uh, innovative thinking at the sort of conceptual and operational and tactical levels. Where, I, where I'm worried is I'm not sure we're thinking this through strategically adequately. And, and this is an issue for government in any time. Um, you know, when you're in government, as Colin knows, you're, I, I used to call it the tyranny of the inbox. You are surviving your schedule in half hour increments. <laughs> It is not a time where you're gonna be, you know, most people, unless you're in the strategy office or the office of net assessment, it's your job to be thinking strategically. Most people in the Pentagon are not thinking strategically. Um, and that's a concern. And one of our strengths as an ecosystem is we have the world of universities and think tanks to help us. I think most of the truly innovative policy ideas that kind of have come out uh, of for very, you know, various administrations since you know, the end of the Cold War have come from um, universities and think tanks. And you know whether it was cooperative threat reduction that came out of the Kennedy School uh, and became a major policy initiative to keep uh, only one nuclear power weapons state emerging from the Soviet Union, not four. Um, you, know, you can think of lots of examples. I would credit a lot of the turnaround of uh, the situation in Iraq and then the eventually, you know, the drawdown, I wouldn't say the very last chapter, but the, the phase drawdown until that to work that Collins led at a think tank <laughs> like CNAS. So I mean, that is a really critical piece. So I would say we have to broaden the lens and, it look, and look across the work that's being done in universities and think tanks and saying, are we investing in the right strategic thinking? And is that strategic thinking getting a hearing in the right policy circles? And I think the answer to both those questions right now is we're not, it's not where it needs to be. Well, and is that because you think there's not enough thinking being done or there's not enough appetite to absorb that thinking within I think it's primarily on the absorption end right now to be yeah. diplomatic. Um, there's no, not even really a regular, recognizable National Security Council process at this point. Um, there's not uh, a lot of consumption of outside thinking coming into government. So I think we're, uh, there is some good thinking 
going on. I would like to see more research in key areas, but uh, I don't think it's getting a lot of traction in the current uh, administration. Well, you mentioned, you just mentioned the, the NSC process or, or uh, absence uh, thereof. I, it strikes me that uh, HR McMaster is here at the Hoover Institution did a lot to try to generate a normal, what I would call a normal Scowcroftian NSC process in an otherwise not, let's just say non-traditional administration um, and had some, some, some successes and, and some challenges there, but the process has completely broken down since then. And I wonder in the context of the things we've been talking about today, I think we could all agree one of the things we've actually been quite lucky at is that we haven't had a major international crisis that wasn't essentially manufactured uh, since the beginning of this administration. I wonder how worried you would be about the ability of this. I mean, we've sat in the Situation Room countless times dealing with these types of, of, of challenges alongside other senior officials and, and the president. Do you know how important process can be? What, what, what keeps you up at night as it relates to how our ability to handle a crisis right now, not, not the crisis of the news cycle, I mean, an actual crisis, like a collision, uh, uh, you know, Americans get killed by Iranians in the Strait of Hormuz, or, uh, and, and it's not a drone that gets shot down, it's, a, it's, an, it's an aircraft, or there's a, an incident at sea with, with China uh, in the current political context. Like what, 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 what worries you about that? What worries me is that um, you, we don't have a well-practiced approach for bringing together you know, all of the key stakeholders and all of the instruments of our national power and all of the best minds to develop options to air not only to not only build consensus, but to most importantly air dissent so that a president has the benefit of different thinking and can take account of risks that the consensus might not be taking adequate account of, and that can allow the president to buy down that risk by, by, by thinking through that dissent. Um, I watched, you know, people can criticize Barack Obama for various things, but he ran an incredibly deliberative National Security Council process that ensured that dissent was not only tolerated, but elicited. Um, and we made better decisions in a whole host of cases because of that. And I worry that there is no process like that. And when there is a process at the kind of cabinet level, it's pretty disconnected from the Oval Office, meaning the president does not use that form to, to inform his own decision making very much or very often. And so I, I do worry about that. Um, uh, and I worry about the turnover, the amount of turnover means a lot of people new in their jobs, a lot of people without strong relationships as a team or with the president. Um, and that those things matter in a crisis when you're under pressure. Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think people underrate the human dimensions of all sorts of uh, things, but the ability to have a, a set of deputies or a set of principals who actually have worked through things right. together before they get to a big crisis. Yeah. So it's not the first time that they've kicked yeah. the tires. Um, back to the audience question, uh, you know, one of the ways in which the Pentagon is trying to adapt to the new technology, technological horizon is to, to more seriously think about um, uh, the role of artificial intelligence in uh, military affairs and, and strategic competition. Uh, the Defense Innovation Board was out here in, in the Valley in, at Stanford not too long ago thinking through the ethics of mm -hmm. autonomous weapons systems. Um, obviously, the Pentagon has stood up Jake, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on this. There's also a lot of talk of there being an AI arms race, an economic one, a, mil a military one. Um, I, I guess, do you, do you think you're in an AI arms race? Do you think that the Pentagon is thinking about it the right way? Do you have any concerns about where things might be added in this in this arena, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis China? Uh, I think uh, that we are certainly in uh, a competition. Um, and I think the primary ways that AI will affect the Department of Defense, if you're not talking on the business enterprise set, uh, you know, healthcare and personnel and that kind of thing, but more on the war fighting piece, is um, AI, if, if we're smart, 
will uh, be used primarily to um, uh, tee up more insight, information and insight for human beings to make better decisions, for the quality of decision making, and enhance the speed of decision making. Um, I, in, despite a lot of fears out there, um, I think there, the Pentagon is very likely to take pains to keep human beings in the loop at appropriate places. Um, that is the current strategy, it's the current directive. Um, I think one of the most horrifying ideas for most military people is to have a bunch of machines out there that you don't, <laughs> that you don't control. Um, especially when lethality, you know, lethal force is being used. Um, and so I think a lot of the, the sort of Hollywood movie nightmare scenarios are probably not going to be the things we have to worry about, at least from our side. Um, I do think policy, the, ethic, the question about ethics and guidelines and policy does need to catch up with the technology. Um, I think the DIB has done some very important work and the department is working on a set of AI principles to guide its AI work. Um, but, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges here too is the department is yet to un invest in the, the fundamentals, really boring stuff, but really critical. You know, making sure you've reconciled your data and you trust it. Um, moving to the cloud, uh, you know, being able to secure uh, uh, that data and, and information flows in a much more distributed uh, dynamic network. I mean, all of these kind of plumbing, not, I won't say plumbing, but they're architectural issues. They're, they're not the sexy things that people want to talk about, but you will not, we will not be able to fully leverage AI until we make those foundational investments. And that is part of what Jake is trying to also advise on things like data standards, things like, you know, you know, how do we how do we approach this um, to get the right outcome? But it it will require the Department of Defense to approach uh, acquisition, design, development, and acquisition of systems in a fundamentally different way. You, if you try to build software the way we build platforms, we will fail. Um, and yet most of the people who are uh, in Department of Defense do not have any experience developing software with agile development. They don't have any experience managing this. We do need a certain amount of tech education for folks in the Pentagon, but also, again, back to that human capital flow. Some of this need, you know, you need a certain amount of tech expertise for the DOD to be a smart customer uh, and a smart owner and operator of these technologies. You know, I, I think you said something very interesting about how the most likely or impactful applications, at least in the near near to medium term, for artificial intelligence and machine learning is in kind of augmenting uh, uh, and assisting situational awareness and battlefield awareness and human decision making. And the, I think people who are thinking about this at the Pentagon are very conscious about, from an ethical standpoint, making sure that human beings stay in the loop. There are some pressures cutting in the other direction, though, right? I mean, the Defense Science Board not, not too long ago, you know, talked about as, as the speed of warfare mm -hmm. gets closer and closer to machine speed. Mm -hmm. There are both advantages, there are, there are a lot of incentives to automate things mm -hmm. um, and to keep human beings further and further away. And you can imagine in areas like cyber, where things are already operating at machine speed, and you see in places like stock trading, you have algorithms mm -hmm. doing the majority of uh, stock trading, that there might be pressure to, to have autonomous cyber defenses and, and weapons. And the last thing is, you mentioned anti-access and area denial situations, right, where having forces that can operate behind enemy lines, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was another reason why you might want autonomous networks and drones to be able to operate and deny environments. So do you, do you sense at all that they, I mean, these aren't me thinking yeah. stuff, right, this is the Defense Science Board thing. No, I mean, I, and there will be areas like, and it really is very much dependent on the nature of the mission and the task. Um, you know, if there will be situations where you might send a swarm of drones in to do a surveillance um, mission that there's no, nobody's going to be using lethal force, you're not going to be, you know, targeting any human beings. 
And that's a very, that could be done autonomously within certain parameters, certain guidelines. That kind of thing is fine. You look at our defensive systems today. Most of our, you know, there are missile defenses, air defenses that have an automatic mode and are, are used in certain situations and certain conditions and parameters um, you know, for defensive purposes because the timelines are such that that's, they need to respond in very short order. So, but I, I guess what I'm saying is that I think, you know, with you're talking, I, I think you're, I'm not, I think the debate will be where is the human in the loop, not whether the human is in the loop. Is it setting the parameters of the mission? Is it uh, setting the guidelines for the target? Or is it having to approve each and every strike? I mean, and I think that answer to those questions will vary depending on the nature of the task and the mission and what we're actually doing. So one of the things that when you were talking about this, there, was a, there were a number of questions uh, that were from the audience that I'm going to try to pull a thread together on about you know, part of great power competition is how is, is, is the kind of lack of confidence that people have in the ability of the United States to actually function and govern. You have a problem of, of a lack of confidence internationally mm -hmm. um, that we aren't all self-consumed. I mean, it's pretty hard to open up the, the New York Times website and find a story that's not about Trump. Right, and uh, to actually find the story about the world, or like we are, we appear to be consumed, and China's clearly playing this up, and mm -hmm. this benefits Russia too. So there's a lack of international confidence about our ability to, to govern. I think a lot of our public has some doubts about whether politicians can actually do the right thing for the right reasons. Uh, and here in Silicon Valley, you, a lot of the things you hear from the private sector is that Washington doesn't have a clue. Right, they don't have a clue about what's really changing. The world, and to the degree that they want to get into our business, they're going to make things worse, right? Uh, I'm not saying that view is right, but that's a view. So, what, what if, if you know, what are some of the things that you think we need to prioritize in terms of restoring confidence that we can actually govern abroad here? Uh, I, I do think it's a problem um, in terms of how the U.S. is perceived, and I do think some you can see some hedging behavior in some of our allies as a result, which is very worrisome. Um, you know, I think that part of what we need to do is counteract some of the extreme polarization and partisanship um, in ways large and small. You know, frankly, some of the best experimentation is going on in the state here, in this state, in the state of California, in terms of different approaches to redistricting, different approaches to um, voting and so forth. Um, and other things rank, rank order uh, voting or rank choice. Um, one of the things that I've been very uh, pleased to be involved with is an effort to get more uh, post 9-11 veterans to run for office in Congress. There's a, a bipartisan group called With Honor and the idea is we, we recruit folks who serve their country to continue serving their country and to put country over party and to make a pledge before they're elected to work across, to co-sponsor legislation across the aisle, to caucus across the aisle, to build a bipartisan caucus that's about getting things done for the country. It doesn't have to just be military veterans, could be others as well. But I think those are the kinds of efforts we need to try to buy back the center. We need to try to find our way to actually problem solving rather than just posturing. Um, and, you know, uh, we can get into that a whole other talk about campaign finance reform and, and um, other things that we could do to try to um, incentivize that move to the center, looking at our media outlets and so forth. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a whole host of things. It's a very complex agenda. It's not one that I'm expert in, but it's very, very important. I think all of us can appreciate the shout out to California. There was a, a <laughs> big event there on campus yesterday on Hong Kong. And um, I think one thing that California and Hong Kong have in common is it's a one country, two systems. We're out of time. I want to thank uh, Michelle for so uh, deftly navigating such I'll just conclude with two final points. One is to, to thank you, Michelle, personally. Um, 
for being such a great role model uh, for so many young people and such a great mentor to me. Um, you, your dedication to public service, uh, your, your ruthless commitment to bipartisanship, your professionalism, and frankly, just the fact that you're a decent human being in a time when we need more decent human beings. Uh, I want to thank you for, for, for being here with me and with us. And as uh, one of the traditions at CSAC is we, we make these posters. Uh, and they they hang in our hallways forever. So I want to present you with your poster, and it will be hanging in our hallways uh, for eternity. I am so honored. Thank you.